the audience team here at Frontline. Last week, as many of you know, we premiered an intense two-hour documentary that took a deep look at how America's heroin and opioid crisis came to be and how communities across the country are now experimenting with radical new approaches to the drug problem in the face of more than 27,000 heroin and prescription opioid overdoses each year. And we saw an enormous response to the documentary with hundreds of audience members and viewers sharing personal stories involving addiction and others sharing your thoughts on everything from Big Pharma's push to popularize opioid painkillers to how and why the war on drugs is now being reimagined. And we're going to continue that conversation here today in a discuss discussion about Chase the Heroin and the issues it explores that I'm excited to help moderate over the next half hour or so. I'm joined by a documentary filmmaker, Marcella Gaviria, who spent a year making Chasing Heroin, and she's the documentary's writer, producer, and director, and this is not new territory for her. She's been closely following U.S. drug policy for some time now, including for the classic 1999 Frontline series, Drug Wars. Marcella, thanks for joining us today. Oh, it's so great to be here. Um, yeah, it, for me, this was really personal territory in the sense that I began my career as a sort of young kid in Latin America covering the drug wars, and I really was curious what had changed since the early 90s. And, you know, were we was this country faced with a heroin epidemic, dealing with things in a different way? Were we still criminalizing right and having a punitive approach. Um, and, and so it was really, um, I was trying to find a place that was doing things really radically different, and I came across the LEAD program in Seattle, mm -hmm. thanks to a really um, great story in the Huffington Post, who has done awesome reporting on this. And, um, and then I met the folks that are on this panel, and I was just so blown away and charmed by, by their work and, and the kinds of things they do every day, and, and it just felt like a natural place. Well, let's introduce uh, the rest of our panel here. Thanks, Marcella. So we're joined by Lieutenant Leslie Mills of the Washington State Department of Corrections. And you saw Leslie in the documentary. She is uh, she helps and works to implement the program Marcella mentioned, LEAD, in Seattle. It stands for Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion. And it's an innovative experiment that's aimed at reducing incarceration levels. And it gives police officers the discretion to either arrest low-level drug offenders or divert them into counseling, social services, or treatment. Leslie, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And we are also joined uh, by Michael Kowalczyk. And she is an outreach coordinator for the LEAD program. And her colleague, Devin Mekjut, who is a case manager for LEAD. And you'll recognize both of them from the documentary as well, from their work with Johnny and Christina. Uh, so Devin and Michael, thanks for being with us. Thanks for having us. And finally, let's welcome Jordan Zuloff, who served three tours in Iraq in the US Army. He has battled heroin addiction himself, and he spoke about losing his girlfriend, Mara Williams, to a heroin overdose in the documentary. My colleague, Catherine, is also here on the front line end um, to help me uh, field your questions. We may not be able to get to all of them in the course of this chat, uh, but we thank you all for joining us for this important conversation. Uh, so we've been gathering questions, we've been hearing from our audience on Facebook, on Twitter, here on Google Plus over the past couple of days. Uh, and, and to get started, Marcella, you, you, know, you sort of gave us an insight into this at the top of the chat, uh, but we had um, a question from Barb Butler on Google Plus, and she said, Marcella, since heroin is so rampant in all areas of the country, what made you decide to focus on the Pacific Northwest, in particular the Seattle area? Well, um, it, it really was because I was looking for alternate ways of dealing uh, with the heroin epidemic. Obviously, um, if you watch the full two hours, you'll learn that the LEAD program actually didn't come out of the heroin epidemic. It came out of the crack epidemic of the 90s. So they had a long experience and were sort of ahead of the curve. And I just wanted to see what that looked like four years, eight years into the program. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it was just a natural place. 
Right. And then a follow-up question. This is from Mubasser Khan, also on Google+. And he was wondering, how did you get access? Law enforcement, addicts, social workers, etc. Uh, how did you forge those relationships? Well, it takes... Um, I mean, you know, I'm lucky to work for Frontline that gives me the resources and time to do this kind of reporting. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think it was really um, a, a matter of getting to know and talk to people for quite some time before actually sort of deciding who we were going to end up filming with. Mm -hmm. Michael and Devin were really instrumental in sort of introducing me to people. Mm -hmm. um, and I met a lot of folks along the way, and, and just as a filmmaker, I would sort of gravitate towards certain stories. Um, I, felt it was very important to find somebody that had died as well and I found Mar Mara's story online and, and I was just, uh, it was one of the first things I did in Seattle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Jordan, why did you decide to participate uh, in the documentary? What was that process like for you? Um, you know, I decided to participate uh, because I, I think uh, it's important that, you know, this, this new approach we're having on drugs and the war on drugs and, um, you know, Mara's story was a part of that. And I knew uh, her story could be useful and, uh, you know, moving this thing forward and changing our way of thinking about drugs and stuff like that. So I was, yeah, really happy to be a part of it. So, okay. yeah. And our next question is from Laurel Sindewald on Google+. Plus. Um, and Marcella had uh, sort of hinted at the origins of the LEAD program. But Laurel asks, would Michael and Lieutenant Leslie Mills be willing to tell us more about how LEAD began? And she's asking this because she's interested in starting discussions to create a similar program in Southwest Virginia. I'm going to defer to Devin. <laughs> yeah, Leslie, do you want to speak first? or? Nope. Sure. Uh, so LEAD began four years ago, um, and it began actually out of um, the public defenders and a number of communities here in Seattle, particularly the Belltown neighborhood, which is a neighborhood in downtown, really struggling with the racial disparity that was happening in arrests. So a lot more um, people of color were being arrested for drug crimes, and numbers were showing that. And they really wanted to find a program that could take an approach that would tackle both the social justice issue of racial disparity in arrest and in poverty in downtown Seattle, and also provide treatment and counseling alternatives that really met people exactly where they were at, that were based in what we call the REACH model of the REACH program that's been operating for nearly 20 years here in Seattle, to do outreach-based case management, where we literally meet people on the streets, in their homeless encampments, um, you know, in the motel rooms that they're floating between, in the areas where they're participating in drug activity so that we actually can provide services uh, in a really unique way that fits their needs at that time. Mm -hmm. um, rather than saying, you know, you have to come to our office at this time and you have to be clean and sober for this long, it's more about asking that person, hey, what do you need to increase your quality of life and how can we decrease the kind of criminalization that's happening. And there's a lot of excitement on a national level. They just mm -hmm. the lead the Defenders Association and our national lead representative, Chris, just actually launched a new website for the with the lead national support bureau for communities that do want to kind of look at starting their own lead program. Mm -hmm. um, and the website for it, let me look really quick, it's leadbureau.org. And that's a great way to find out more about kind of the roots of the LEAD program and how maybe it'd be good to start one in your community. Mm -hmm. So that would be my personal perspective on it. Okay. And, and Leslie, we saw you in the documentary in a very memorable scene uh, offering help instead of what a lot of us expect to see in the interaction between the police and, uh, and the drug user, uh, which is arrest and incarceration. And we saw a strong response to that. And I'm wondering, how did you become involved with LEAD uh, sort of in the first place? And, and how has it changed the way you do and approach your work? Well, um, it's a complicated question for me because I work at the pleasure of the governor of the state of Washington. Mm -hmm. uh, again, the pleasure of the secretary, who's a cabinet member of the state of Washington, 
Mm -hmm. So I work under legislation, and the legislation tells us certain things that we have to do with probationers and parolees when they're in violation of their conditions of mm -hmm. supervision. And some of that is what we call swift and certain or swift and certain and fair, where the person, when they commit a violation, immediately go to jail for a short period of time, and sometimes a long period of time, depending on the violation. Mm -hmm. LEAD was introduced to me um, before it became LEAD, before it was called LEAD, um, the I ideology behind LEAD is grassroots in and of itself. You always knew somebody who could help somebody get into treatment. You always knew a cop who would use an alternative to incarceration to get the person to Harborview Medical Center to get them treated and eventually into treatment. But it was the offender population, the folks that were using narcotics, who said to us, hey, we need treatment on demand. If you would just get me a place to sleep tonight, get me some mental health treatment, help me with my substance abuse, what I call the trifecta simultaneously, then I will have an opportunity to, to heal this thing. And what can you do to help me? So it was them coming to us and then finding this pot of gold called LEAD that gave us this opportunity or this conduit to meet all the people that are working with the same clients, the prosecutor, the defense attorney, the counselors, the housing people, the hospitals, the jails, the 911 emergency service centers, the addicts, the probation and parole are all dealing with the same people. So why not sit in the same room together and solve the problem? So does it take a village? Yeah, lead is a village. Mm -hmm. And Marcella, for you, uh, was this uh, was this sort of a sea change in how um, the drug issue was being in a, approached from when you were looking at this back in 1909 um, for that Drug Wars series? Absolutely. I mean, I, I think that, you know, we've always just thrown people in jail. The, the sort of changing the narrative and kind of realizing that people have substance abuse problems and that they simply need to find uh, a way to get themselves into treatment and that, you know, police officers and counselors would do that. I mean, I, I was sort of just blown away by the the amount of energy it requires to, you know, basically track down these people and help them out and, and be there for them and, and catch them when, when they, you know, in Christina's example, when she was very vulnerable. Um, had she not had Devin in her life, I'm not sure mm -hmm. what would have happened at that moment. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then turning to a question, this is from Pam Burson on Google+, and she's wondering if age and maturity seems to have an effect on survival rates for heroin addicts. She says, you know, in her experience, sometimes it seems that the younger age uh, folks under 25 seem to have less of a chance. And we, we heard something like this from Tom Thompson on Facebook as well. He said, I'm an alcoholic and an addict in long-term recovery. I have 26 years clean and sober. Among the meetings I've attended, there are very few millennials in long-term recovery. It seems to me to be much less likely that addicts in the younger group can get and stay clean. Um, why is that? So I just, does that dovetail uh, with the experience um, that you as a group have had? And obviously, um, Jordan, you yourself have battled with heroin addiction and um, and sort of what what treatment aspects were most useful for you as you went along the way? Um, you know, I had a kind of an unconventional uh, way of getting off heroin. I mean, I I did the detoxes and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. Um, but personally, it just came down to uh, me just, you know, saying enough is enough, you know. And I know that's not very conventional and like it really goes with like what we're talking about but um you know in regards to like the younger people and stuff i mean you know i think younger people you know with drug problems and stuff are always gonna uh you know they're, they're just you know the youth you know and i was doing really stupid things when i when i was young too and mm -hmm. i'm not saying like you know, it's because i could go off back home, you know what i mean but uh yeah, I mean, it's. I did hit a point where I was like, "Wow, this is. Uh, I'm gonna die from this," you know. And it, that that dawned on me. And it's. I think some of the younger people don't realize how dangerous it is and what they're really dealing with. And uh, 
you know, and with Mara, and that's what it was, you know, it's just one time, and like, and that's it. You know what I mean? Serious stuff. So, does that does that answer your question? No. Sure, sure. And on the you know on the treatment side, uh, a, a lot of the one of the most common pathways to heroin that we've heard both in responses um, to folks who shared their personal stories of addiction with us, and um, sort of on a national scale is prescription opioid painkillers as uh, as a pathway. We have a question a question here from George Despinick who says, are there any prescription painkillers that are almost as effective as opioids, but not as, not as effective? If so, then why aren't they prescribed more often? And how much responsibility does the pharmaceutical industry take for the opioid addiction epidemic? Mm -hmm. And Marcella, I know this was an area that you touched on in the documentary. Uh, what are your thoughts? I don't know of any drug that's um, a painkiller that's not addictive. I mean, an opioid is an opioid, um, and it, you know, I think they've been pushed on um, too many people. And and you come home with your bottle, and you think it's not a dangerous thing. But if you're one of the twenty percent that that have addictive tendencies, you might end up getting hooked. So you know, it, it's. Um, you know, we, we all need painkillers when we have surgery and when our, we have whatever teeth pulled out, but, you know, you've got to be quite careful. Mm -hmm. uh, but maybe um, the experts on the panel would know more about that. Um, Does anyone else want to weigh in? So uh, we have noticed an uptake in, in younger white males uh, being referred to the LEAD program. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of them that I have met started with pain medication. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not sure about their ability uh, be due to their age in, in getting clean or getting off of heroin or whatever their choice is. There, it tends to be that people that are younger may, may not be done yet. And, and that's where lead is super important because we're not requiring you to be done, right? We're using motivational interviewing and, and just really meeting them where they're at. And if they come to a point like Christina did where I am done, we're there to help support them and find a path that works for them. For some people it could be Suboxone, for some it's Methadone, for some it's straight detox and, and getting clean. But I, I believe that this is my personal opinion, there's like a breakdown of a family system, right? So the kids that we're getting now are like the children of addicts. Most of the referrals lately, their parents were addicts, right? So that, like this is systemic. This is from the top down. This is generations, right, of people using drugs. And these are the kids of those people. Well, to that, um, to that end, we heard from Penny Butler on Facebook. Uh, she she's hoping there's going to be a part two for the documentary and she said she would love to see a story on the children of addicts and how a parent's addiction shapes their young lives we you know we saw some element of that in Johnny's story um, with his mother overdosing on heroin when he was 19 um, and in also in Johnny's story in the film we saw you know, there's sort of that heartbreaking scene where, you know, he gets word that there's a, a bed for him in a treatment center and he makes his way out there and there isn't a bed after all. And that speaks to the larger uh, issue that there are more than two million Americans who need treatment for heroin use and abuse of prescription opioids, but only half have access to it. That was from a, a recent uh, President Obama's recent speech on the opioid epidemic. Are, are all of you from sort of where you sit on this issue, are you seeing um, changes towards um, expanding access to treatment? Are you seeing shifts that are heartening you in this, on this issue? Uh, they're working on it. I think it's yeah. going to take some time. Sorry. I think on a larger scale, there's lots of mutterings about legislation and funding that's coming down the pike that's going to change the treatment system and make it more accessible. Mm -hmm. But right now, I mean, I'm a, like a chemical dependency professional here in Washington, so that means I'm licensed to do drug and alcohol assessments on clients. And so I do a lot of assessments on clients in the LEAD program. And I can tell you that, I mean, I really hustle to get people into different kinds of treatment. <laughs> and it's like typically at least a 60-day wait. 
60 wow. days to go to inpatient treatment. And wow. there's a huge waiting list right now for methadone maintenance. So mm -hmm. you may have seen in the film that Christina got on methadone maintenance right away. Well, what it didn't show in the film is that for that first week on methadone maintenance, she's spending five hours a day at the methadone clinic waiting for her dose evaluations for the first five days she's being dosed. You know, she had to reschedule that appointment a bunch of times. It's like a lot of legwork to actually get in. And the only reason she was actually able to get to the top of the wait list is because our program has, you know, is owned by Evergreen Treatment Services, which is a major provider of methadone treatment in King County mm -hmm. and other parts of Washington State. And so she was prioritized because of her hospitalization and her participation in our program. But a typical 20-year-old person who walked in and said, I want treatment for methadone is going to wait four to five weeks for an intake appointment. So just realizing that, you know, even if people say they really want treatment and they're ready, the options aren't necessarily there for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you brought up um, methadone, and we saw uh, quite a few responses uh, from our audience who had questions and wanted sort of more information um, on methadone as sort of a substitute and as a as a medical uh, treatment for for getting off heroin. Jason Raveling asked us, "Why is methadone a reasonable solution for dealing with drug addictions? Isn't it just another drug that would have adverse side effects?" And Marcella, from you know from the filming and the research they did um, for uh, to make the film, we saw the you know the town of Bremerton sort of uh, grappling with uh, with bringing a methadone uh, clinic in, and we saw the hurdles that addicts faced um, when, when they did not have access to it. Um, can you speak uh, to that question and what you learned about um, methadone as a treatment option? I, I was sort of surprised by the amount of people that are so afraid to get on methadone, like oh, parents and addicts, and everybody would be like, I don't really want to do that. And, and the reluctance was such that it, it was, um, you know, I, I think we still sort of view it as um, replacement therapy is a complicated thing, and, and people don't want to get addicted to the replacement drug. And these drugs are very addictive. So I was actually going to throw it to Jordan because I was curious. I, I believe that Mara was sort of afraid of going on methadone. Did you guys ever talk about that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, I'm going to give you my opinion here on methadone and being a former user. Um, it was kind of out of the question for us. Uh, methadone um, can be harder to get off than heroin in the long run. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a pros to it, of course. You know, people are, you know, on the streets and, like, they're maintaining it and stuff. But I think, like, long-term, methadones can be a little worse um, because it's so – getting off of it is uh, worse than getting off heroin, you know. So, um, yeah, for me, it just wasn't an option. Like, we uh, – same, same with Mara. I mean, it, Personally, you're better off, I think, just uh, if you're ready to do it, you know, just uh, get cold turkey or, you know, get into a treatment or a detox or whatever. You're going to have better long-term results, I think, uh, with that versus being on these programs. And, um, and that's, that's my opinion. And uh, back to uh, the treatment stuff, um, you know, I mean, as of now, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, King County does not have a, a detox center right now, and that's uh, that's pretty shocking to me. I know it's probably a, a you know a money thing, but that's uh, wow, that's something that needs to be addressed. I think you know so. Interesting. Well, thank you guys for weighing in. And of course, a reminder to our viewers that we can't provide treatment or medical advice individually, um, but we encourage everyone to, to, to research more on all of these issues that we're bringing up. And um, Jordan, when speaking about Mara's overdose in the film, you mentioned that people who relapse can take one hot shot and then that's it, they're gone, and then this happens all the time. But we saw a lot of our Facebook audience was, you know, they, they were really struck by what you said, and they were asking, what is a hot shot, and asking for sort of more 
uh, information on this phenomenon where someone is, you know, someone is in recovery um, and then all of a sudden it goes wrong. Okay, so say someone's, uh, you know, stop using, they're clean, and they decide to pick back up, you know, and they'll use the same amount that they did uh, when they used, thinking it's going to be okay, you know, because they had a tolerance to it, but, you know, then they go back and they don't, and maybe the heroin's uh, stronger or whatever the case may be, and that's that's what a hot shot would be. So, does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Comment on the the methadone and the detox. So there is detox in King County. The there, actual, is there, yes, and there has been. And and when RCKC closed, a different agency opened up the treatment bed. So it's just a different facility, right? Oh, okay. And then as far as methadone, and and this was posed to me when when I had a client struggling with being clean and relapsing and his life going to hell, was that had he been on methadone maybe he wouldn't have relapsed and, and maybe he wouldn't have died, right? So the, the point of methadone is kind of to maintain and let them get their mental health under control or other factors in their lives until they come to a point where they are ready so that they don't end up ODing and dying, right? It's giving people a chance in the interim. Yeah, and I think I totally, I think there's so many different perspectives on methadone and I understand why there's a, a lot of stigma about it because that people have varying experiences with it, just with like with any kind of medication. Mm -hmm. You know, people have a lot of stigmas against antidepressants, but the federal regulations on methadone are so tight that you have to go to the clinic every day, and that makes it a really unique medication when it's used for opiate replacement. Mm -hmm. But from, I mean, my perspective as a as a counselor um, and a social worker is that. Um, kind of like all of us are saying in Jordan as well that methadone can allow people to stop their intravenous drug use. It can allow people to stop being in and out of the hospital, to get the mental health and medical care that they need, to get stabilized, to get custody of their children back, right? It can stabilize someone and it's important I, I think from my perspective to think of it like any other medication. If someone's struggling with chronic depression, a physician's going to look at prescribing that person an antidepressant. If someone's struggling with a chronic opiate addiction, then a physician's going to look at prescribing that person an opiate replacement mm -hmm. so that they can deal with what really is a medical issue. So I guess if you're of the belief that drug and alcohol addictions are a medical issue, then methadone becomes then something we consider a medication like any other. And for those who are interested in, uh, in more background on this issue, at our website, pbs.org slash frontline, we have a story up on the options and obstacles uh, to treating heroin addiction, uh, and, and, and a variety of approaches are discussed there. And Leslie, did you want to weigh in as well? Yeah, because I'm seeing it from a, a different purview than other people are because I'm in the law enforcement end of it. Um, mm -hmm. And our job is about reentry. People that go to prison, people that are arrested and go to jail over and over again. How do we resolve that? Um, how do we rehabilitate? And in some cases, how do we habilitate? Um, I can't answer a question about methadone with one answer. Um, I have seen people successfully uh, have methadone, uh, synthetic heroin, and get off of it. I've been told over and over by many that if you go blind on methadone, meaning if you don't know the amount of the dose that you're getting, that you're less likely to get addicted to the methadone because you don't get hooked on how much they're giving you and eventually you are able to wean yourself off of it because they medically very carefully wean you off of it. I've seen that successful. I've seen people get prescriptions for Suboxone and sell it on the streets so they can use heroin. I mean, these are, it's, it's, not, it's not that it's complicated, it's that I think about like breast cancer. Um, if you treated all women the exact same way, if they had breast cancer and they walked in and said, you have a tumor, take this pill, boom, you're cancer free. Wouldn't it be an amazing thing? And yet we have found out in the medical community over a hundred years that you have to treat each person individually. And that's what LEAD does. So you're looking at the person, you're looking at their socioeconomic background, their education, you're looking at their race, their religious preferences, their agreement to take or not to take medication, 
their physical body. Are they heavy? Are they thin? Are they a long-term addict? Are they generational addicts? You know, these are things you have to look at. It isn't, you have to take an aerial view, you need to put the person in a Petri dish, and you need to talk about all of those things mm -hmm. to find out if they're going to be compliant on medication, if it's going to work. So it's not that it's complicated because people aren't bright enough to figure it out. It's complicated because each person with a name and a last name and a heart and a sister and a brother and a parent needs mm -hmm. to be looked at. And that's what this program allows. And the reason why I like it is because it's not me pushing it on them. It's mm -hmm. them coming to me at my office and telling me I'm committing a law violation right now because I want to get in your program. Mm -hmm. So if somebody comes to me and says, I have a crack pipe and heroin in my pocket and I want you to arrest me, please, I'm begging you so I can get into treatment. I think the people that are using drugs have figured it out that they need this village of people because we cannot do this on our own. Even Marcella's given me advice on things she's learned and then I learned from Michael and I've learned from frontline producers. Everybody has a little bit of a story that gives us a good indicator to help the next guy and it isn't going to work with everybody. I have a son who got was given pills when he had a, a tib fib fracture. Little did we know that he was really enjoying his oxy there for a while. We were giving him his oxy. We were giving it to him because the hospital gave it to us. So we had to nip that on the bud. Everybody has a story, but it, it, you have to look at the whole house, the mm -hmm. whole picture behind that. So I'm sorry that it's, it seems like it's complicated, but one person in methadone doesn't always have the same result. So it's, Sometimes it works magically and it's absolutely beautiful, and other times, no, it doesn't work at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. So all of you at some point have, have touched on the cycle of incarceration that we've seen. And we, we learned the lead originally grew out of um, concern over racial disparities um, in drug arrests many years ago. Um, and we've heard from a lot of our audience um, on social, including Willis Stevenson on Facebook, about the what's perceived as a disparity in approaches to the crack epidemic that ravaged the black community in the 1980s and um, and how politicians and others are viewing this current heroin epidemic. Um, Ron Dodson on Google Plus said that during his uh, interview with Frontline, Eric Holder seemed very reticent to address the fact that now that addicts are predominantly white, we've decided to treat addiction as an illness rather than a crime. He says, as an almost 70-year-old black American, I find this troubling. Am I being too thin-skinned, or is that disparity real? Um, and Marcel, obviously you and Martin Smith sat down with Eric Holder um, and, and asked him your questions um, on this front. Um, and, and can you tell us a little bit about what he told you? Well, I, I think a lot of politicians were quite candid about the fact that the reason that politicians are willing to think about this a little differently is because the majority community, the majority white community, is getting affected with this epidemic but disproportionately. And of course politicians care about their constituents. So um, I, I found it amazing that they were so candid about it. Um, and yes, it is racism. Would anyone else like to weigh in? Well, we do have a story on our website, again, at pbs.org slash frontline, and it's a look at how the heroin epidemic impacts and affects communities of color um, and how it differs in communities of color as well. Um, so we have time for just another question or two at, at this point. Um, and it's this is one sort of for the general group you know it's a big decision to you know to participate in you know first of all to make a documentary um, that addresses you know what's being called one of the biggest uh, drug epidemics in American history and then to participate in it is, is also a big decision and I'm wondering from each of you you know what has the reaction been um, you know, for Marcella, in terms of making the documentary and having it out there in the world, you know, what have you heard in response to it? And then for each of you who have participated and shared your story. <laughs> anyway, so uh, okay, so I'll go. Um, I struggle sometimes uh, because I have some past experience, personal. Mm -hmm. 
um, and I think my mom was a little worried about what I was going to say on national television. <laughs> I do. <laughs> that everybody has a story, and I think Leslie touched on that. And if we can all bring our personal experiences and be examples of, of what recovery looks like, right, it's going to help that next person, right, that, that person that, and, and that you actually do not need to have a drug addiction history to be able to be helpful in this field, right, mm -hmm. but it, it does help impact the way people look at addicts, right, so when, it, when it's the middle class uh, kids dying, if that's more people invested in helping us overcome this, great, right? Is that why lead started? Absolutely not, right? It was it was black men getting arrested for crack, right? Mm -hmm. So whatever it takes to get everybody on board, let's do it. Mm -hmm. And Jordan, what have you heard in response to you know sharing your story and sharing Mara's story in the documentary? Um, what I've heard is the community uh, say, wow, it's uh, it's really good that what we see around us every day and have been seeing for so many years is finally being addressed, you know, and that's the bottom line, and that's so important. You know, it's just like, okay, so it's coming to, we're shedding light on this situation finally, you know, and that's, that's the response um, I've gotten, you know, so, mm -hmm. yeah, good things. Right. Leslie, how about you? Um, whatever screw up we've made as a nation about race, uh, which is disheartening, uh, we're talking about it now. And right. We're not talking about race now. We're talking about the human condition. We're talking about heroin. We're, we're getting it out of the closet, the stigma out of the closet. And I invite anybody, when I'm on the street, I don't see a color. I see a drug addicted person with mental health problems. And I will help anybody who comes to me or comes to the Washington State Department of Corrections and asks for assistance because that's our job and that's my life's blood. As for what this show has done, mm -hmm. uh, personally, uh, first of all, my LinkedIn blew up. Um, I, <laughs> I'm enormously popular right now, which is and everybody has a question about heroin that I am ill-equipped to answer. So I, I, need to, I need to learn a lot more about this craft because... I don't have all the answers, and, and I need to learn more. Um, but I will tell you, a, a personal story is the, uh, I, I live in a small town on a peninsula, and mm -hmm. I was returning some napkins to Ace Hardware <laughs> after a party, and I got a call on my answering machine at home, and the person says, hello, this is, uh, hello, Officer Mills, this is Maggie from Ace Hardware. Um, can you come in to see me as soon as possible? I would like to meet you. And I said, my God, number one, how does she know I'm an officer? <laughs> and two, why does she want to meet me over napkins? But I went, go figure. She returned, I returned the napkin. She gives me my money back. She gives me a gift card. And she shakes my hand. And she says to me, I can't tell you what you've done for me and my family hearing about this. Mm. Wow. Wow. Marcella, any Ace Hardware gift cards coming here? <laughs> uh, I think it's it's actually just been meeting so many wonderful people in the making of this film that's been so transformative. Uh, I've been making documentaries for 20 years. I uh, often get some wonderful responses, but this one was um, almost profoundly different. You know, I got beautiful letters from all walks of life, people that were in the program um, that called me in tears. And, and honestly, I'm, I'm in, very proud of the fact that uh, perhaps the film touched a bit on, on at least humanizing what addiction was. Mm -hmm. And not just showing that human side, but, you know, hopefully in, in some ways it will improve the discussion and make people realize that it's all well and done to divert people into services, but if those services aren't there, then the system is, is not working for millions of people. Mm -hmm. 
Well, Marcella, you, you mentioned humanizing addiction, and, and as a final question, uh, the, the human faces and stories that you told and the characters that we and so many others met in this documentary, they just left such an impression on, on our audience. So for a final question today, do you have any updates uh, that you can share on Johnny, um, on, on Christina, on Carrie, on, on where they stand on, the, on their journeys? Um, uh, Carrie's husband passed away right before the documentary aired, so it's been an incredibly rough time for her, and I know that moving forward without her sort of soulmate and support will be really tricky, but she's hanging in there. Uh, Johnny managed to get himself into a new clean and sober facility. He texted me the other day saying that the lady had a lot of rules, but she was cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, and I think Christina's working hard at sort of figuring out her next steps and, and landing in a junior program and figuring out uh, how to get to be an Avita stylist and, you know, all <laughs> sorts of cool things. And... Um, yeah, but it's been amazing to meet all of them, and I think they'll be a part of my life for, for as long as I'm alive. Oh, wow. Well, it's also been amazing to have the chance to, to engage with all of you uh, and take questions from our audience. So Marcella, Jordan, Devin, Michael, Leslie, thank you all so much for your time and for being here with us today. We really appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. And, and thanks to all of you in our audience who watched Chasing Heroin and shared your stories with us. We are, are very excited here at Frontline. We have just gone live uh, with a collection of hundreds of personal stories of, of addiction or of having loved ones who struggle with addiction um, on our website. Uh, there's also lots of related reporting um, on everything having to do with the heroin and opioid epidemic on our site, from Martin Smith's extended interview with Eric Holder to um, that feature that I mentioned uh, looking at how the heroin epidemic differs uh, in communities of color and just a lot of uh, rich reporting and resources. So we hope uh, that you'll visit and continue the conversation there. And thanks again to all of our panelists and we'll see you next time. <laughs> Thank you. Bye everybody. Bye. Bye.